I'm Alex Michelson. This week on The Issue is President Biden's future. With us, Axios national political correspondent Alex Thompson, who's been breaking story after story. From the White House, Tom Perez is here, the senior advisor to President Biden and the former DNC chair. And a different view from conservative commentator Dave Rubin, also in the House, as The Issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, you're watching The Issue is. I wouldn't have picked Vice President Trump to be vice president. So I think she's not qualified to be president. President Biden confusing Vice President Harris with former President Trump during this week's high stakes press conference. Alex Thompson of Axios with this scoop. Biden camp tries to rebound after bad effing weeks. Axios's Alex Thompson joins us now from Washington with more. Alex, welcome back to The Issue Is. So good to be here. The top Democrat in the House, Hakeem Jeffries, who wants to be the Speaker of the House, visited the White House this week and then put out this letter. Uh, and the letter says basically that he told the president what the Democratic caucus has been telling him. Here's something the letter doesn't say, Alex. It doesn't say we endorse Biden. We're behind him 100 percent. How do you read that and what's happening behind the scenes on Capitol Hill? This is one of those classic political letters that it actually is about what he doesn't write rather than what's on the page that is newsworthy. And you're right. They, there's not a universal, we think you're the nominee, we're, 100, we're behind you 100%. And that's because Hakeem Jeffries' caucus does not feel that way. Beyond the people that have gone public, I think we have about 20 uh, or so, probably getting around two dozen of House Democrats that have called on Joe Biden to step aside. There are a lot more that are privately considering doing the same thing, that have been drafting up statements. And part of the issue here, and part of the reason why Hakeem Jeffries went to the White House to talk to President Biden, is I can tell you that members of Congress are having a hard time getting in touch with the president and his top team. Um, and not just like backbenchers and people that are are sort of gadflies, like serious people that are have serious concerns and want to be on board with Joe Biden. But the fact that he, they are not being able to get through is only raising more questions. And that's what Hakeem Jeffries' letter and what his meeting was about expressing, making sure the president understood the severity of the crisis of confidence in parts of the Democratic cau caucus. Yeah, and notice is reporting that there was a call with the Hispanic caucus and that Mike Levin, the California Democrat, on the call said, Mr. President, you should step aside. And then the call was quickly stopped after that. Uh, let, let's talk more about your reporting, because years before other reporters dared to even bring it up, you have been talking about this issue of the president's age and the steps that some of his aides have taken to sort of hide his age and cognitive challenge issues. Can you expand on what some of those have been? So one example was the schedule. He very rarely was on camera in public outside the hours of 10 to 4. Aides told me privately and some aides even said publicly that he never did, almost never did events before 10 a.m. After 4 p.m., it's much more common that he would do a closed door fundraiser or something that's not on camera. And when he was on camera, you noticed that he would often make more gaffes. Aides told me that he would get tired. The little stage management things they did in order to try to obscure it. Now, some of them seemed you know, little and harmless, right? You had, you know, hey, wearing more tennis shoes, using the shorter stairs. When they were walking to Marine One, instead of him walking by himself, they used to, they would send sort of a phalanx of aides that would walk between him and the cameras, making it a little bit, his, his gait and his walk a little bit more obscure. So, you know, there were steps the entire White House was taking to sort of put a bit of a cone around him to sort of obscure what was, becoming a worse and worse health issue. And you've also spent years researching a potential book about the Biden family. Can you talk about what Hunter Biden is doing right now uh, in, in relation to this crisis for his father? You know, there is this sort of Biden mythology with some truth is that basically the Bidens are at their best when their backs are against the wall and they unite and so that's why you've seen Hunter become more involved. He attended a speech writing meeting after the debate. You know, right after the debate, it was Joe Biden met with his family at Camp David. They also did a photo shoot there, but they were very involved in the meetings. The family is more involved and powerful now than they have been almost ever, um, because when at moments of crisis, the, they sort of circle the wagons around themselves. 
What is Barack Obama's role behind the scenes? The only public remarks he has made is, uh, is one of support right after the debate. And while there's been reporting trickling out, he is being very careful. And the reason is because Joe Biden still deeply resents the fact that in Joe Biden's mind, at least, Barack Obama chose Hillary Clinton over him before 2016. Now, Obama's team has a very different version of events, but Joe Biden believes that, feels that, wrote about some of it in his book. And as a result, there's this feeling that if Obama were ever to be too aggressive in trying to push Joe Biden out of the race, it actually could backfire and ensure that he does stay in the race. As a former Biden aide told me, Obama already used that chip once. You can't push Joe Biden out of a race against Donald Trump more than that. And lastly, based off of everybody you talk to, do you have a gut feeling about how this thing ends? Does Joe Biden end up being the Democratic nominee in November? I hate predicting. I mean, my <laughs> gut is that Joe, Joe Biden is a very resilient person and a very stubborn person. And Joe Biden believes with almost a religious fervor that he is the most electable person against Donald Trump. And if you believe that, why would you get out? And so I do sort of think that barring something else coming down the line, Joe Biden is going to ride this out and stick it out. And the thing that's worrying a lot of people that have worked for Joe Biden, that dedicate a lot of their primes, their lives to his very lengthy career, is they feel that if he stays in this and loses, that this could be end up being the first line of his obituary and sort of undermine, you know, a lot of that legacy. But, you know, Joe Biden has, has surprised doubters before. And that's sort of that that sort of self-belief is what he's counting on. Uh, Bill Maher has called him Ruth Bader Biden, sort of referencing the fact that she stayed potentially too long and then ended up having a justice replace her uh, who ended up leaving to Roe v. Wade being overturned. Um, Alex, thank you. Uh, we can check out your reporting at Axios.com. And a quick note about you. You know I'm biased about you as a fellow Agora High School grad, but I want to take a moment to give you your due. You talked about these issues when almost nobody else would. Everybody was scared to. And now you've been everywhere with scoop after scoop. So thank you for all the important and fearless reporting. It's really, really great. That's high praise, especially from someone I really respect too. So thank you very much, Alex. Great to have you on The Issue Is. Up next here, special assistant to the president, Tom Perez, with his take. You're watching The Issue Is. Here is Tom Perez earlier this year at an event with L.A. Mayor Karen Bass. He's here in his role as senior advisor and assistant to the president and part of the White House Office of Intergovernmental Affairs team. Perez served as the chairman of the Democratic National Committee from 2017 to 2021. Before that, he served as labor secretary in the Obama-Biden administration from 2013 to 2017. What a resume. Tom Perez, welcome to The Issue Is for the oh, first time. It's good, good to, to have be you with you, Alex. In studio. Thank you so oh. much. Uh, what a week for President Biden. Um, you know, there are a lot of folks, including yeah. Democrats, that are calling for him to step aside. Some are challenging his mental acuity after seeing what they saw on the debate stage. As somebody who works with mm -hmm. him and talks to him all the time, was that debate performance uh, an aberration? Of course it was. Uh, I, I've had the privilege of working with him uh, dating back to the 1990s when I had hair. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, he's never been the world's greatest debater. But we're not electing the debater in chief, we're electing the commander in chief. And as someone who had the privilege earlier this week of uh, being at the NATO ceremony, um, the respect that the president commands and has earned, NATO's stronger than ever now because of President Biden's leadership. Our economy is stronger than ever because of President Biden's leadership. People are, I understand the concerns because it was, uh, he had, by his own admission, a lousy debate. Uh, and what, what I, you know, what I see uh, day in and day out is someone who's tireless. It's a 24-7 job. As you know, in the run-up to that debate, he'd been back and forth to Europe, not once, but twice. Um, and uh, I know what that takes out of me when you go yeah. six, seven time zones. But that, I mean, that's yeah. part of the job, though, right? Of course it's it to, is. They'd be yeah. willing to do that at any time. And we know, unfortunately, yeah. the aging process only goes one way. Uh, and he's asking to be in the job for four more years. And if we saw that at this point, and we think about four years from now, are you comfortable with him being the president at 86 years old? Absolutely. I mean, look, 
we, he had a bad debate. And again, by his own admission, no excuse. Uh, but we look at what we've accomplished and there can't be no debate about the fact that this administration has done so much for so many different people, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's you know, $35 insulin. And frankly, there can be no debate about the fact that women's reproductive health is on the ballot. And so there's so much at stake. You know, democracy is at stake. Dobbs is uh, at stake. And, and frankly, common decency. But that's the reason that a lot of people are concerned, arguing that President Biden is having problems articulating that message that maybe Vice President Harris or somebody else could make the case that you're saying against Donald Trump better. Well, I mean, he had he had a bad debate night, but you you look at the polling. The polling is still dead heat polling. Is it? Uh, How is it yeah. dead heat? Happy to show you yeah. the polling. It, you know, you 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 look at the polls of polls, and this is a dead heat race. People understand that if I care about women's reproductive health, Joe Biden's fighting to protect it, and Donald Trump, um, by his own admission. Uh, brought forth the demise of Roe versus Wade. Right. And, uh, you know, another big issue is immigration. I know sure. you've been involved with the, the Biden administration's efforts on that front, uh, including an executive order. Uh, can you explain what that means specifically for the people of California? Sure. You know, the president acknowledges our immigration system is broken. That's why day one he introduced, Alex, comprehensive immigration reform. And he said, and he continues to say, I will work with anyone and everyone uh, who wants to work with me to get it done. He tried to do it earlier this year, introduced a bipartisan bill. Uh, one of the most conservative members of the Senate was uh, working together with us. And do you know why that bill failed? Because Donald Trump said, we can't give Joe Biden a victory. So seeing that the Republicans want to weaponize the issue and not solve the problem, the president did two things uh, earlier uh, within the last uh, eight weeks or so. Number one, um, an executive order uh, on border security. Mm -hmm. And as a result, in people coming to the border, the numbers of people coming to the border are down 40% since mm -hmm. that executive order. And then secondly, and this is very important for folks here in California, um, further executive action to allow so-called mixed status families where mm -hmm. one of the family members is um, undocumented, the other is a US citizen. And what the president said is, we are going to use a legal authority we have called parole in place. So if mm -hmm. you've been here 10 years or more and you're married, uh, you can get out of the shadows. And by the way, about 130,000 um, families in California, uh, we believe, qualify for that. And it's time to bring them out of the shadows and into the sunshine. And it's time to stop politicizing immigration. Um, lastly, we do something fun on this show to get to know you a little bit better. Oh. This is called Personal Issues. This is a rapid fire. First thing that comes to mind, you get to know your cultural favorites. So we get to know Tom Perez. Are Excellent. you ready? Uh, what is your favorite TV show? Um, my favorite TV show right now is The Bear. Favorite movie? My favorite movie was um, uh, Common Ground. Favorite sports team? Buffalo Bills. Who's the best comic book hero? Wow, jeez. Uh, Dennis the Menace. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite book? Uh, Common Ground. And who is your role model? Um, Roberto Clemente. Why is that? Um, my email address has uh, the number 21 in it. And uh, he died helping people in need. Uh, and he, uh, those of you who know baseball, he was a rule five uh, pickup by, the, uh, by Pittsburgh. So people didn't give him a chance. And he rose up from humble beginnings to do great things, not only on a baseball field, but more importantly, in a humanitarian way. And you're also a music fan, right? Absolutely. Uh, you've got the Dominican roots, right? Yeah. Um, and I hear you're a fan Merengue. of D uh, Despacito. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me to I sing, though. <laughs> I won't, but we are going to go yeah. to break with yeah. a little Despacito for you. Excellent. Tom Perez, thanks so much for being here. It's we been appreciate it. a pleasure to be with you, Alex. Yeah. All right, Thank enjoy you. the music. Despacito, quiero respirar tu cuello despacito. Deja que te diga cosas al oído para que te acuerdes si no estás conmigo. Despacito. 
With us now is Dave Rubin, who started his career backing mostly liberals and is now backing mostly conservatives, or at least Republicans. Dave Rubin's show, which we encourage people to check out, is called The Rubin Report. What a time, though, in politics. It's a historic moment. President Biden insisting that he's staying in the race. What do you think of that? All the debate did was shine a light on it that now nobody can ignore. And it's been fairly obvious for years, even since before Joe Biden became president, uh, that there was a cognitive problem there. To watch him on debate night was only to see without any question what most of us have known and what many of us online have been talking about, and to see the split screen, to see the gaping mouth, the confusion, you know, the inability to complete a sentence, it, it is now burst forth, and the mainstream media does not know what to do with it. And that's really where we're at at the moment. It's a very sad moment for America, outside of politics, whether I support his policies or not. And kind of remarkable that his team asked for that debate. They thought uh, that he was ready for it and put him in that position to be doing that. Yeah. So, so now the question is, where does the party go from here? Biden says, I'm still running. Uh, it seems like a lot of folks in the party are saying Kamala Harris is next, if not Biden. Is Kamala Harris, in your view, a stronger nominee? Do you think she could actually get more votes than Joe Biden at this point, given everything that's happened with the debate? It's a little hard to say because, look, nobody is excited. I, there were very few people that were excited about Joe Biden in the first place. The polls have bared that out for quite some time. It's very clear that the party apparatus does not want her, but there isn't a mechanism really to get rid of her. So if they're able to either force Joe Biden out, which Jill Biden clearly is against, and Joe himself or whatever, left there doesn't seem to be for. But even if they're able to, able to trigger whatever that movement would be, well, then you have to figure out a way to push her aside. Now, I will say this, for all of my frustrations with Democrats in general, and it's, it's really unfortunate as someone that considers myself an old school liberal, I will give the devil his due here. The Democrats will do whatever they need to do. If they need, if they feel that she cannot win and Joe's out, they will find a way to get rid of the first black female potential president. They will do it and they will put up my good friend Gavin Newsom, or, really they, or, so. or they will put up Gretchen Whitmer, or it does not even matter. They will do whatever they have to do. Um, so next week is the Republican National Convention. Donald Trump will have his chance to address the country from there. What do you want to hear from him? What I'd like to hear from him is actually what we've been hearing from him, which is a pretty measured and controlled Donald Trump. I think he allowed Biden to kind of make the missteps, and I think that that's what we should see from Trump now. You don't have to be the braggadocious Trump. We've all seen it, we know it, we know it's within you, you know you can do that at the rallies. If he can just control some of the little birds on his shoulder that might be saying, oh, make fun of somebody or give this nickname. I think that's what people want right now because everything's so wildly out of control. We'd like something just a little more decent, let's say. Um, uh, let's also talk a little bit more about you. Um, your dad, yep. uh, relatively new dad. I right? got two kids running at yeah. home. They're little humans. They run around yeah, that, and that's do all and, kinds and of crazy husband. stuff. How yeah. has fatherhood changed you? Oh my, um, I'm better at talking about politics than, than about my personal life, but how does it change you? You know, look, I think that I've learned that there is way more out there beyond just me and my needs and all of those things, and we all kind of know that intellectually, but when you wake up every day and there are these two little humans there that you can hopefully, if you do it right, fill up with enough good ideas and good stuff and the right lessons that they will go out there and do amazing things in the world, and I know I, we don't have the most traditional family by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I think families come in all different shapes and sizes and stripes and colors. Uh, and something else you guys do as a family that's interesting is you go off the grid, right? Every August <laughs> yeah, for an this entire is it. month this is it. where One you month. say, I'm not weighing in on anything. I mean, talk about how that works. How so that literally, you. literally. Because this August is a pretty big political month. I will not have this thing in my pocket for a month. You know, I did this, this will be my eighth off, off the grid August. I did it the first year as a joke. It was sort of like, let me just see if I can do this and not have a phone and not pay attention to the news and not read the newspaper and not watch anything or anything else. Literally no electronics, no computer, no iPad, no nothing. And it was wonderful. I found myself walking on the beach one day and I suddenly started thinking about friends from third grade that I remember their names that mm. I hadn't thought of in 30 years. Or I would remember entire albums, songs that, every lyric of a song. And what I realized was we are, we are just inundated with endless information, mm -hmm. endless scrolling, which we turn into doom scrolling, only looking for negative things right. and all of that. And I thought, 
let me try this every year. And, and I think it's one of the things that has allowed me to stay sane in politics. If, for example, Joe Biden is replaced yeah. as the nominee. I will not know. Well, will, I, will do, will, I will do everything I can not to know. Wow. I mean, you know, I, I literally have to avoid pizza places or gyms because they have TVs on and the rest <laughs> of it. It's, it's gotten more complex each year. Right. This year it feels quite literally like, oh, Donald Trump might be in jail, Joe Biden might not be the nominee, <laughs> Kamala might take over and have got kicked out. Yeah. We could be in World War III. It's a lot, but you know, at the end of the day, what can I do about you're, it? So I'm still gonna go to the beach. Very blissful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure gonna be the lucky yeah. one. I'm still gonna be having um, tequila on the we, beach. We, uh, we do something called personal issues on this show, which yes. is we do 30 seconds to get to know your cultural favorites, things that you're interested in right now. Uh, uh, here we go. Uh, first thing that comes to mind, what is your favorite TV show right now? The Office. Uh, favorite movie you've seen lately? Uh, the uh, Mad Max, the new one, Furiosa. Okay, favorite book you've read lately? Oh God, I don't read as much as I used to. The last thing that I read was probably, oh my God, it's been a while. I, uh, 12 More Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. It's really been Who is your favorite basketball long. player? Clyde Drexler, without question. What's your favorite way to relax? Oh, I just put on Seinfeld and I fall asleep on the couch. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Well, Dave, thank you for coming in and sharing your views. I'm glad we got this done before August. <laughs> I'm very excited for the cookies. I can yes. take the cookies. I don't think you eat all the cookies right now, right? You can take the cookies. Right? Enjoy. Yeah. Thanks for coming in. Best Good of luck you. to you out there. More of the issue is when we come back. Next week, we'll be reporting from Milwaukee for a special edition of The Issue Is from the Republican Convention. We will have conversations with all of the top California Republicans from right there, Fiserv Arena, which will be our headquarters next week. As we wrap things up this week, a reminder of the last RNC back in 2020 at the White House. This is how things ended. <laughs>